Hello, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to come here and talk. Uh, apologies to anyone who may have seen a version of this talk before, but I think there's not very many of you. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what I call geometric extension algorithm, and I'll explain what they, that means. So this is, for me, motivated when I, I tried to understand two papers by a uh, work of Hugh Carter, uh, maybe a number of years ago, uh, but still this decade, on uh, an algebraic study of extension algebras and then some applications to KLR algebras. And so Carter uh, worked with uh, in uh, with LIH Sheaves and uh, through uh, use security results, and I'm but instead of that, what I'm going to be doing is try to work with any uh, coefficients that we want, which means that we can't use any uh, deep results of, that require characteristic zero. But, so we'll be using um, the notion of evenness, which will come up at some point later on in this talk. So we, I should say motivated by So the setup is, is as follows. So I'm going to have a map y to x, f. And so these are going to be complex algebraic varieties. consider them in the classical topology. So, and I'm going to put a lot of assumptions on this map. So let me just state them. So y is going to be smooth. Uh, f should be proper. And then I want there to be a group acting on this whole situation. And g equivariant. And then one more that I'll put up now is that G acts on X with finitely many orders. And so to, to get an idea of the sorts of uh, situations that uh, why I might have these conditions, so let's first give the sort of example, or any example I'm going to go through in any detail. I could take a, a point, and I can take the disjoint unit of a point with the affine line, and that maps to the affine line. Uh, I'm going to take the point mapping to the origin, uh, and this has an action of Or clicking group possible or clicky group where uh, S T acts on X by S T X. Yes, this this um there's a there's a one parameter subgroup which keeps this whole thing stable, but it, it's gonna be more useful for me to think about this. So um we'll, we'll see what I can do with that later. But some other examples that, that come up is, um, so this is actually a, a this, is, this will eventually give us a um, A2 KLR algebra Ri plus J, for those of you who know that's the geometry behind this particular A2 KLR algebra, it's the simplest one that's known in the Hecker algebra. But some other Situations where this type of thing comes up is in, is um, in the study of KLR algebras. Um, so here, one just I'll say this briefly, but uh, one fixes a fixes a quiver Q. And then in this case, you take uh, x to be the space of 
Oh, and and the uh, and the uh, graded. Maybe I should say something more about Q vertex set I and V uh, I graded vector space, and then you take X to be the rep space of representations of Q on V. Um, and then y is the flags of representations of q on v, are complete flags. And then a group is going to be g o v, which is the product of i and i of g o v i. And the fact that uh, G acts on X with finitely many orbits here. That's the fact that this is a that this algebra has finite representation type. Uh, so now I, I should actually say the type of Dinkin type. If you had a, a Dinkin type quiver, it has only a finite number of indecomposable representations. And so one can come up with other situations which have a uh, similar geometry. Uh, I'll just mention something else. And briefly, you could take a uh, disjoint union of some hot Samuelsons over what I'm not going to say exactly, but it's going to map to a flag variety. Now this is the geometry of um, Category O and uh, Zerbal bimodules. Another sort of example that, that fits up in fits this setup is you could take um, X to be N, which is uh, N by N Gilpoint matrices, and Y to be uh, the cotangent bundle to the flag variety. And then F is the Springer. The Springer resolution. That also satisfies all these, these properties. So to, to this to this data. So now let K be a field. Uh, to this to this data, we define the following algebra. So A F B. It's a an X algebra. So I look in the G equivariant category of derived category of geocovariate sheaves on X with coefficients in K. Um, from this setup there is like one sheaf I can write down, which is I take a, the constant sheaf on Y and I push it forward through F. Um, F is proper, so it's not going to matter if I use a star or a shriek push forward here. And then I take its derived endomorphism algebra. So this is a, a perfectly good algebra that I can consider. So um, I'll make a few remarks about this. First remark is that um, I want to consider this as a, a Z graded. So it, it, it assumes a grading because from the, the grading on the X, the homological grade, a Z graded associative algebra. Uh, in general, it's not going to be graded by the natural numbers, and it will, because of doing things equivariantly, will often get, uh, it's often going to be infinite dimensional. Uh, one can also ask questions about whether or not I should actually be taking the cohomology and thinking about it as an associative algebra, or whether I should be 
thinking about uh, things I say as a differential graded algebra, um, I'm not going to say much about that except that in situations that one tends to come up in Lie theoretic geometric representation theory, uh, you often end up with something that is formal if if your field has characteristic zero, and I really don't have any idea what about questions of formality if K has positive characteristics, so you have to enlighten me on that if you know. So, for example, in this example where you had a point disjoint union A1 mapping to A1, and I can describe this very explicitly, uh, and it's an exercise to compute this. So it's a set of two by two matrices where A, B, and D live, in, live inside polynomials in two variables. And C lives inside the ideal generated by X minus Y. So it's a very nice um, looking algebra. Uh, if you if you look at the the, the KLR example. Flags mapping to representations, then, then you get AF is the KLR algebra, which is why I called it the KLR example. So there's been a few talks about this certainly last week. So they come up in categorifying quantum groups. And I'll probably try and say a little bit more about them later on if I get time. But this is the motivating example for me. Because this is what I'm... So, if I said at the start, Cato proved various homological properties of these KLR algebras uh, when the field was of characteristic zero using geometric techniques. So, these homological properties are, involve being affine quasi hereditary, which I'm going to define for you. And also, which implies things like that it has finite level dimension. Now, okay, and then if you wanted to do uh, things in the other cases, you'll get, well, I was a bit vague about Bot Samson to flag where you get some algebra whose representation theory is going to control some Zerbal by modules. Um, and then in this, in this new potent code, uh, it's a semi small map, which means that things are nicer. Uh, you're going to get, uh, as your algebra, you're going to get the, the group algebra of the symmetric group in degree 0, and then you're going to get some polynomial piece in higher degree. Uh, and, and you should be able to do something which generalizes it to, uh, the share, to get a share algebra if you take a disjoint union of various resolutions, but I haven't really thought that through. So I'll just say that you should be able to do it. And if you really want to know, you should read maybe Carl Mountner's paper on how to get the Schrodinger from sheets on the Newtonian code. Okay. So we've got this set up, but actually, I would like to put in some more conditions because uh, they're satisfied in these cases, and I, I need them to. to to get anywhere. So more assumptions. Um, so first assumption, so so if x is in x, let me just say that gx is going to denote the stabilizer. under the G action. So I'm going to make two more assumptions. So one is that for all x in x, 
if I take the odd equivariant cohomology of a point with coefficient in k, oh, uh, let me say also gx is connected and there's, there's no gx equivariant cohomology of a point in odd degrees. So um, a few things about this, this type of remark, apart from the fact that it's like, satisfied here. Um, so once you have a, a connected complex algebraic group, this is automatic for all but a finite number of characteristics, k. So it's a fairly harmless assumption. And if your group gx, and, and so if, there you go, say gx, Modulo is unipotent radical is a product of GLNs, and this is always true. So, you, when, when your groups are GLNs, this type of thing is automatic. This comes from uh, classical computations of cohomologies of Grassmannians and flag varieties. So, that's another assumption, and then just when you thought we were done, there's one more big one. And this is really a big one. So there is a bijection. Well, so on one side, I'm going to take direct sum ends of this push forward and up to shift and isomorphism and on the other side I'm going to take G orbits on X and uh, I'll say a little bit more about how this bijection will, will go. Is that they'll? I don't just want a bijection. I want it to be somewhat sensible. And, the, and there's only one sensible bijection that one can hope for, which is by thinking about the support of a sheaf. So I could take uh, closures of d orbits, which is clearly the same as d orbits. And this, I want this map to be the closure of the support. So, um, when you say direct sum ends, you just mean any sheaf that such so any sheaf can be written as a direct sum. Any sheaf such that this. So this is a everything. So this is a Kroll Schmidt category. So everything. Oh, okay. So F star KY can be written as a direct sum of indecomposables, and these indecomposables are unique up to reordering and isomorphism. Yeah. So it's this finite set that I want to have here. It's a very strong condition, right? It's a very strong condition, yes. But it's, it's true in, 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 in examples, which is why it's okay. So, um, in the KLF example, it's, it's the KLF example, it's true, yes. So, in the KLF example, it's sort of telling you that you, you have <coughs> enough simple representations, I guess, of the KLF algebra to categorify the whole quantum group. But, um, now, that, now that I'm erasing this, I can say maybe. A couple more things about these types of assumptions. Uh, the first one is sort of the key to any inductive uh, constructions because uh, the, the category of GX covariant sheaves on X can be built out of the category of GX equivariant sheaves on a point for all orbits because 
of my assumption that there are a finite number of, of orbits. So that this gives us a lot of control then to do inductive arguments. Um, the, the other assumption uh, that I wrote up here, when we, when we think about it, making this sort of assumption is what I, I believe on the representation here any side for the algebra is going to be like the difference between being quasi-hereditary as opposed to being cellular. So if I were to not make such an assumption about a bijection, I might expect something that is cellular. And by making such an assumption, I'm going to end up with something that's going to be quasi-hereditary. Um, if, that, if that means anything. Okay. But yeah, so also that's why like these examples that I have, we've got like this disjoint union, which is somehow often forces this bijection to happen. Because if you look at this, this point disjoint A mapping to A1, uh, if I didn't have that point there, I wouldn't end up with this bijection. So because the, the, the skyscraper sheaf at a point, it, the, the, the point in A1 is an orbit. And the only reason the skyscraper sheaf is a direct sum end of F star is because the point is mapping there separately. All right. So let's um, now change gears and talk about some representation theory. So I want to, um, it's going to be a little bit abstract, maybe. So I want to define affine quasi hereditary algebras. So um, the point of well, so the point of an affine quasi-hereditary algebra from an axiomatic point of view is that it's like a quasi-hereditary algebra, but I'm allowed to have polynomial rings as well. Um, so they're motivated because uh, there's a theorem that I proved with John Brendan and Sasha Kletcher before we had this name, and it says that KL algebras in finite type are affine quasi-hereditary, as are a few other and there are a few other examples known as well. So this, this sort of axiomatization was due to, to Clesher. So And so uh, to spoil the show that that's an example up there, that, that two, two by two matrices with the, this condition on, on C is going to be an example of an affine quasi hereditary algebra. Uh, it's a particularly simple example because there's only two simple modules, but at least it's, um, you see some of the structure. So let's, uh, so let A be a Z graded. And let me just use this word Lorentzian algebra over K. And um, I'll explain exactly what this means. So uh, if I take the sum over all N, so if I write A is a direct sum of N in Z, A N as its nth graded piece, then I could take the dimension of A N, multiply that by Q to the N which should be a Laurent series in Q. So each of these dimensions is, a, is finite and there's some bounded property. You only get finitely many negative powers at N. Okay. So once you, once you have such a, an algebra, it's actually not hard to see that this implies that the, the number of irreducible modules uh, up to like isomorphism and gradient shift is finite. Uh, basically the proof is that um, anything in sufficiently large degree has to act by zero or an irreducible module. 
So uh, you're reduced to looking at for, for looking at simple modules, you're reduced to looking at uh, representations over a finite dimensional quotient. But I should say everywhere that uh, I'm only going to look at graded modules everywhere. So. We know graded representation theory. Otherwise, I think we'd lose some finiteness control. So we have this let. So let's let pi be an index set for the simples. Uh, this this set of irreducibles um, up to gradient shift. Okay, okay. So in, in real life, um, one often has some sort of duality on, on one of these algebras which gives you a canonical choice of gradient shift in each, uh, for each simple module, but for my purposes right now I don't care about that, so we're just going to ignore it. So let me write L of pi, so for pi and pi, let me write L of pi for the simple module and P of pi for the for its projected cover. Okay. And now let's say that I have let let's say I have a partial order. on my set pi. <coughs> okay, so now I can define another class of modules, which is which I'm going to call standard modules. So a standard module is going to be something which is relatively projective. And, it, and I'll, I'll explain what that means right now. So let delta of pi, this is my standard module, be the projective color of L of pi, um, but in a different sub in a different subcategory. In the subcategory A modules with all simple sub quotients, isomorphic to L of sigma up to gradient shift with sigma bigger than or equal to pi. So this is a perfectly nice abelian subcategory of A modules that I can just take its projective cover inside there. At the moment, this is a very general construction. Um, hopefully, I'll be consistent with my greater than or equal signs. I'm trying to make it consistent with the geometry, which may explain why it looks opposite to some people. OK, so now I can give a definition. So the category A modules is so it's going to be affine quasi hereditary if the following conditions are are satisfied. So yeah. So one. If I take the endomorphism algebra of a standard module, which uh, 
if you if you are familiar with qu quasi-hereditary categories, then all the standard modules are just the ground field. There's not much, there's nothing happening here. Ooh. Is a polynomial algebra. Okay. So I'm allowing polynomial algebras. This is where the polynomial algebra is coming to the picture. Secondly, there's another condition which is that uh, delta of pi is finite and free over b of pi. Uh, free is the same as flat, which you. Um, this is slightly different from Clechet's definition. It's a little bit stricter um, in that he allows more algebras here. But in practice, we're only going to come up across polynomial algebras, and polynomial algebras are better behaved than arbitrary prod of a projective scheme. So we'll stick with that. Free means flat, if you in this case, which is maybe more categorical thing saying. And then um, where's the other thing? Then there's this condition, which I think if you if you're not familiar with uh, quasi hereditary algebras, this looks a little weird. But it guarantees that you have good homological properties. There's a, there's a, a p of pi as a filtration. with the following. So with P of n, the last subquotient is the, the standard for pi and P of i mod P of i minus 1 is isomorphic to uh, with a shift with Sigma less than pi. So that's a uh, definition. It implies very good homological properties of these modules involved. Case where um, all these, there's no polynomial algebras appearing. So it is just the ground field? Yeah. If you just modify it by that change, it becomes. At the least. Okay. There are a few like actual experts on quasi hereditary algebras in the audience, so I'm a little bit scared to say anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think I should probably leave that on the floor. So, so a, it's a standard example of some, some category which is quasi hereditary is category O for the algebra. At least that's a standard example for someone like me. So there, there in that case, your um, standard G or Bobas. I realize I should leave this because I want to say, example, this, this is true here yeah, in this case. Um, I thought I could also make a remark about um, but the, in, in, in practice for us, so a little sneak pre preview, for us, uh, we will have uh, that these algebras B of pi are going to have some very natural geometric interpretation as the, I'm just building up the suspense, <laughs> as the, Equivariant cohomology of a point. So these assumptions that I made on the equivariant cohomology of a point being um, being having no odd cohomology actually force this to be a polynomial ring. Right? 
actually the only example I know of where that I've ever computed where this has odd probability, it's also a polynomial ring. <laughs> but that was that's just like uh, uh, PSL2C in characteristic two. So that's probably not a representative example. Uh, what's the relation between pi and x? Um, it'll come from the bijection that I erased. So so the the pi is going to be in, in bijection with orbits, and then x is. So x is just some point in the orbit, and then gx is a stabilizer. It doesn't matter which point in the orbit you take. But pi is a representation, right? The crystal for some assignment in the... Yeah, so uh, I haven't explained that yet. I was going to... Pi will correspond to a, a sum end, which will correspond to an orbit, yes. Um, so I wanted to say... Uh, uh, at least point out that this example is affine bias plane. Um, so, I find, yeah, so, okay. I, I should have called this affine pious way. That was a better thing to say. And then, because the, the theorem is that, like, a category is affine highest, highest weight if many the algebra is affine, is, is quite very true. So, I should have called this, I should have called this highest weight. But then, then once we become familiar with it, we use this terminology, it gets confusing. So sorry about that. So let's let's show this at my highest point. Um, so that's, no, that's the it's algebra. Just, now it's a question of origin. I wanted to match this definition. I can give you a, a, an ideal if you want. But. So in this case, I mean the. I, the, the projectives, there are two projectives, there's P1, which is like A E11, where E11 is the usual matrix element. So this is like the set of all column vectors of the form A C. So there's this, so we should say uh, the ring and the ideal. And then there's P2, which is A. Two two, um, which is B D, which is so actually um, they're abstract. Oh no, let me just not say anything. So they they look a little bit different, but not not, not much. And then um, if you want to compute the standard, uh, it. it so, so this one, I, I, I should probably tell you what the order is, and I didn't write that down. So let's let's say so this one is going to be standard as well. So in the definition um, of, of delta of pi, obviously one of the one of the standard modules is projective, the one for which this category is everything. So here I've got one is less than or equal to two. So I'm looking at the subcategory of A modules with simple subquotients that can be anything. So I so this is standard delta one, and then you can check that the um, that this endomorphism of delta one is k of x y. That's um, I guess something to check. Well, it's endomorphism to the standard, so it's E A D, <coughs> and so you can just that's kxy. And then your other standard is the following. You can take um, there's, a, there's a ring homomorphism from a to k of xy mod x minus y which sends a, b, c, d to d. This is a subjective Thing. And this is actually isomorphic to the other standard delta two, and so uh, one checks then that the endomorphisms of delta two are this 
polynomial ring. And that there's a and this last condition is that there's a short exact sequence if you well that's obviously because so P2 is going to be the projective cover of delta 2, and you can check that its kernel is P1. And so in this case you have all these properties. And so um, let me now try and clarify this confusion between these names, affine highest weight and affine quasi hereditary. So you can also give a definition A is affine quasi hereditary. Yeah. Um, maybe in the interest of trying to get to some more interesting stuff, I might not say it, but, but it, it means that there's a, well, I'll say a few things. There's, it's, it's very similar to the, the notion of quasi hereditary. You get a, a chain of ideals with, with some, some nice property. And I've already given you what the chain of ideals is, is in this case. So in this case, there's only one non-trivial ideal in the chain, and that's the kernel of this homomorphism. Okay. And so, I mean, you can ask me for details if you want later, but there's a, there's a theorem which allows one to go between these two notions, which classically is due to Klein partial partial stop and um, in this affine case is due to Kleshev which which says that the A mod is affine highest weight if and only if A is affine So, you get to pick whichever point of view is most useful for, for you at the time. Okay. So, let's return to some geometry. So now let's right, so so we have this x algebra of this of this push forward. So I guess one thing I didn't actually explicitly mention is that these types of push forwards are much easier to deal with in characteristic zero because of the decomposition theorem. But I'm, I'm trying to do this in general, or as, as great generality as possible. So we have we have this set pi, which is naturally bijection with the, the simple modules. And then 
with the simple modules are in bijection with projective modules, or I should say, in the composable projectives. And then I can, the indie composable projective for such an algebra like this, because um, this category, so this is going to apply this category that I'm working in is having the Kroll Schmidt property. This is in then by junction with direct summands in decomposable. Direct sum ends of this push forward sheet. And then I'm back to isomorphism and gradient shift. Uh, everything should be up to gradient, up to shift. And this was the thing that I declared was going to be in bijection with G orbits on X. Now, I kept doing all this, this homological algebra stuff and it required having some partial order on the set of simples. Now, on this side, there's a very natural partial order. I can take the, the closure. Partial order. And then I just pull it back through all of these things and I get a partial order on my set capital pi. So from this point of view, getting partial orders on your on your sets of simple modules is a very natural thing to get. So let me before I state a theorem, I need to make one more definition. So, so f, which is from y to x, is even if h odd of f inverse of x coefficients in K is zero for all X in X. And if you're sort of a person who does geometry, like actual ge like varieties of general type, then you look at this and go, well, of course this never happens in practice. But in, in our lead theoretic situations, this is what tends to come up off the most easy way to to see this is um, see this type of condition is if your variety um, if your fiber has a paving by affine spaces then cellular cohomology gives you this automatically uh, so fibers of uh, bot Samuelson resolutions always have that, that sort of affine paving property um, there are some other more complicated ways that you can prove that this that vanishing thing happens and I'm going to Tell you about one of them right now. So now I can um, state what my theorem is, and maybe I should. Um, this is probably also this part is, I guess, implicit in Carter's work as well, even if it's not. I don't know if it's stated in exactly this form. So. With all our assumptions that we've made, so assume everything. Okay. So, so we have this this map f from y to x, which was g equivariant and, and everything, and, and y was smooth and all the stuff. That then we constructed this algebra, and then we have this bijection, and I get this partial order. Then. So if f is even, <coughs> which I guess I haven't assumed yet, but we're going to assume that too, <laughs> then <laughs> af 
is affine quasi hereditary. And I, I, for, for that partial order, for the closure. For the overclosure partial order. So as long as we have geometry, we get as long as we have nice geometry, we get nice representation theory. Um, nice representation theory sort of says that one way, another way that I didn't mention that you can sort of think about affine quasi heritage is that it's the category really is glued out of B pi mod for all pi. So it's glued out of representations of polynomial algebras by a summer cobalt situation. Okay, so that's that's nice, but there's actually another. So this is one. There's another theorem that I can I can say, which is again like assume everything. But not this, because that wasn't, that was just a definition. So, if uh, what do I say? If AF is affine if AF is affine quasi-hereditary and is concentrated in even degrees, then there's a converse. Then F is even. <coughs> so one of the... Um, more surprising things about this for me is that two is actually useful. As in, you, you can use two to show that, that some, some fibers don't have odd cohomology vanishing. So two. Theorem two is useful. Um, so here's, a, here's another theorem. Which is, I guess I mentioned this before verbally. Uh, so any finite type KLR algebra is affine. Terry. And so you get a corollary. Really running out of room. Which is that the, the fibers of this map in the in the this this map F for In this, this map F from flags of Q to rep Q is even. So um, this is, I guess, this is due to maximal. In type A, but in type B and E, this is somehow unknown. So this is, I think, a bit of a surprising, uh, surprising way to prove that something doesn't have cohomology vanishing. That something has cohomology vanishing. And so I should say a few words about why one might actually 
be interested in such a situation. <laughs> so if you have this... Um, well, what's your grading on that now? Um, because in the, in the usual KLR, for grading, they're not... They're good question. So in the usual KLR grading, they are even, essentially. All right. So because of what I did, so at the start, so I've, I've taken um, F star KY, F star KY. If you take that grading, then it's even. Then the KLR grading is even. Just take the X grading. Yeah, so, so the, the, the KLR grading that one normally sees is one, one wants that, one replaces F star KY by something equivalent that's, that's self-dual. So you shift it, and what you're doing is, is that because Y is disconnected, you're, shift, you're shifting by the dimension of Y, but you're, you're shifting by the dimension of Y on each piece. So you've got to shift by one somewhere and shift by two somewhere else. So you're not getting something even, but you're getting something that's essentially even. Yeah. It's a good question, because it, it confused me when I first thought about it. Uh, this, this, this example that I wrote on the board is therefore uh, uh, confusing from that point of view, but even, um, so the nil Hecker algebra, which maybe I should have put up as an example, um, yeah. is, tells you, you, you can't, you can't regrade that in any, any way whatsoever. Well, yeah, like, because you, in that case, why it's connected, so you don't get to regrade it. Yeah. So. So for the benefit of everyone else, um, uh, if they don't quite know everything about what Vanessa was asking, um, the, the, I at least mentioned there's a, there's a very simple example, which is the nil Hecker algebra, which comes out when you take, um, what do you take? You take the flag variety, so the DLM, or upper triangular matrices, and then you map that to point, I guess. And then you take this G equivariantly. And your, your algebra AF is this, and it's Merida equivalent to a polynomial algebra. What is it? It's Merida equivalent to this. This particular polynomial, right? it's, it's actually n by n, n factorial by n factorial matrices over this. But you take this this particular geometric setup, and you get the nil Hecker algebra, which is not positively graded. So um, I did want to say within like two minutes, and I will do it within two minutes. So so one upshot, uh, just a few remarks. One upshot of having evenness is that that gives you access to the theory of parity sheaves. So the theory of parity sheaves is some sort of replacement uh, in terms of to things like not having decomposition theorem in positive characteristic. Um, I really don't have time to give a lecture on parity sheaves right now, so I won't. But, um, once you have parity sheaves, uh, you can actually, in this in this KLR example, one can actually use that to uh, to generalize Harper's reflection functors to characteristic P. So. Um, these are just some functors between KLR algebras that categorify. So these, there's a brain group action on the quantum group, and by by algebra 
for homomorphisms or out of automorphisms, and in some precise way, this categorifies this, and so you can generalize that. Um, there's a couple more, basically, a couple more things I wanted to say. Uh, maybe the only other thing is I wanted to say we can give a geometric description. of standard modules. It's actually very nice. Uh, so I'll write it down. So if you take a delta pi, then that is the x from this f star ky with uh, So here, kappa is the inclusion of an orbit into x. Um, so there are other families of modules. So you take projective modules. We know how to describe projective modules because of that description up there. Simple modules are multiplicity spaces in that decomposition. Here we have a very nice description of standard modules. There are also proper co-standard modules, maybe they're in if you have to think about, but you can do something. There are also tilting modules due to Fujita, and I have no idea what they look like geometrically, so maybe you can tell me. I'm, I'm out of time, so I'll stop. So th this means that on, on rank Q, on, on this loosely equivalent variety site, that, that you have the full collection of parity sheaves. So it, it tells you that, that all of these are sum ends of F star KY of parity sheaves. And so in, in this particular case where it's useful is that then you know... Okay, so here you have two, basically you have two descriptions of a, of a stack and you want to know whether the sheaves that you have on each side are the same, and by saying that they're both parity sheaves, then somehow you've described them intrinsically in terms of the geometry, so you can match them. Okay, so what do we, is, this, is this useful in the graph? Did you get something? So I think it's useful. Because you can get this out of, out of it, at least. Although I expect maybe more often you would use theorem 1 than theorem 2. Any other questions? If not, let's send the speaker again.